let's take a look at an after-tax return question, which certainly can involve a lot of moving parts. Not only do you need to understand total return off of different investments, but how taxes involved will impact the returns of those investments and how to put the big picture together on these calculations, which certainly can be tough at times. To do so, we will attack a question together. Let's go ahead and put the question on the board. An investor in the 37% tax bracket makes a $108,000 investment in a specialized fund on March 18th, 2022. Over the next several months, the investor receives a total of $4,320 in qualified dividends, none of which is reinvested. On March 20th, 2023, the investor redeems the fund for a total of $122,000. What is their after-tax return? Okay, quite the question. A lot of moving parts here, a lot of things to be aware of. We will break this down on a sentence-by-sentence -sentence basis to make sure that you feel comfortable and confident and uh, prepared for these types of questions on the actual exam. Okay, going back to the first sentence. An investor in the 37% tax bracket. Pause, let's just look at that. What they're making reference to in this question is the investor's marginal federal income tax bracket, which ranges from 10% on the bottom all the way up to 37%. This is a progressive tax system that we have here in the United States, which means the more income you make, the higher the tax bracket you're assigned. And yes, 37% is the highest income tax bracket out there, which means this investor is probably making a pretty decent amount of money through their job or their business. Uh, usually to get to 37%, you have to be making half a million dollars plus every single year in income. Now in some questions, just understanding that someone in really the 30% range in terms of their tax bracket is usually making a decent amount of money is important. And it's especially important in a question like this where we're looking for the after-tax return. Their tax bracket will influence how they're taxed on some of the investments they make money on. But let's keep going after that. Uh, they make a $108,000 investment uh, in a specialized fund. We'll, we'll pause there. Now, $108,000 is going to be what we refer to as the original starting basis or the original investment that the investor made. Now, that's going to be a really important thing because that's going to be a big part of the after-tax return formula. In fact, let's go ahead and put the after-tax return formula up on the screen. After-tax return is going to feel somewhat similar to total return, and essentially, after-tax return is total return, but with taxes factored out of the formula. So basically, it's all tax-adjusted gains and losses, or just gains and losses after taxes, divided by the original investment, or what we might refer to as the basis of the investment. Now, $108,000 certainly seems like it'll go in the denominator down there at the bottom where the basis should be, but just keep in mind that if the investor made any additional investments into the fund later down the line, or if they have reinvested, say, dividends or capital gains they received from the fund, that would increase their basis and increase the number we put down there in the denominator. We've already gone through the question. They didn't put more money in. They didn't reinvest any of the dividends or capital gains back into the fund. So we can go ahead and assume $108,000 will be the basis. It is the original investment into this security. So that will go in the denominator of the calculation, but we'll go ahead and put that aside for now. We still have a good amount of work to go through before we actually do the calculation. The investment was made on March 18th, 2022. That date actually will be important for us and we'll see why once we go through the rest of the question. But let's go to the second sentence. Over the next several months, the investor receives a total of $4,320 in qualified dividends, none of which is reinvested. We already talked about the reinvestment part. Again, if they had reinvested these uh, dividends back into the fund, that would have added to the basis, but they didn't. Now, $4,320 in qualified dividends, that is a really important part of this question. That is a return. That's money in the investor's pocket that it seems like they took in cash, which just means they maybe sent that money to their bank account or maybe they, they took it out. Uh, they were sent a check from the fund. Who knows? But they took it and that's no longer in the investment anymore. That's just return off the investment. Now, the key term here is the term qualified dividend. If you've been through a lot of the material, one of the more frustrating words you've probably come across is the word qualified because qualified can show up in a lot of different areas. There, there are 
qualified plans, there are qualified investors, uh, and there are qualified dividends. And I'm really just talking about three of the most common ways we use the word qualified. There's even other ways we use the word qualified. In this context, the reason why knowing the dividend is qualified, um, the reason why that's important is because dividends are either qualified or non-qualified, and whichever one they are will influence the tax rate that is assessed on the investor. If it were a non-qualified dividend, they would be assessed a tax rate on that dividend that would be equal to their tax bracket, which in this case here would be 37%. Qualified dividends, on the other hand, are taxed for some people at literally 0%, but for most investors, will either pay 15 or 20% on a qualified dividend. In particular, the investors at the highest tax brackets, which this investor is at literally the highest tax bracket, they pay 20% on their qualified dividends. You can safely assume if they mention someone at the 34 or 37% tax bracket, you can assume they'll pay a 20% tax rate on qualified dividends, and we will make that assumption in this question. The investor receives $4,320, but will pay a 20% tax rate on that dividend. The easiest way to figure out how much they keep after tax would be to multiply the amount of dividends they received by 100% minus the tax rate they're facing, again, 20%. And basically, it's kind of like saying, hey, the investor received $4,320 in qualified dividends. 20% of those dividends are going to go to the IRS, paid to the government. The remaining 80% is kept by the investor. So $4,320 in dividends multiplied times 80% will give us a $3,456 after-tax return on those dividends. This represents one of the two forms of return they're receiving on this fund, so we're kind of halfway there. Let's go to the next sentence. On March 20th, 2023, the investor redeems the fund for a total of 122,000. Okay, we have to be careful in this sentence here uh, for a couple reasons. Number one, the word redeems is a mutual fund related word. Mutual funds are redeemable securities, which means if you're going to sell the fund later, you have to go back to the issuer, sell the fund back to them, and they redeem your shares. For all intents and purposes, just means the investor sold the fund for $122,000. Now let's go back to the date. Here's the other part that's really important. The date of March 20th, 2023 tells us that this is actually a long-term capital gain that they're locking in. If we go back to the very first sentence, they bought the investment originally for 108,000. They're selling it for 122,000. So we know that's a gain. In fact, that's a $14,000 capital gain they have. Back to the dates, they held the fund for at least one year and one day, which is when we get to a long-term capital gain. In fact, they held the fund for one year and two days. Now, the reason why that's really important is if, if it was a short-term capital gain, and a short-term capital gain would have occurred if they had sold the fund on March 18th, 2023, or any day before that, short-term capital gains are taxable at the investor's tax bracket, which would have been 37%. That's a pretty big tax rate. But because it's a long-term capital gain, long-term capital gains are taxed in the same way that qualified dividends are. Some people pay 0%, but most investors pay 15 or 20% on long-term capital gains. Again, this investor is in the highest tax bracket, so we can assume their tax rate on that long-term capital gain will be 20%. Now, we just need to factor taxes out of the return. A $14,000 long-term capital gain multiplied times 100% minus the applicable 20% tax rate, basically $14,000 times 80%, will give us $11,200 after tax. Now at this point, we've really done all the hard work. The, the tough part about this question is figuring out what the return is and what applicable tax rate applies and then factoring the taxes out of it. We have a $3,456 after-tax return on the qualified dividends and a $11,200 after-tax return on the long-term capital gain. Adding those two numbers up, we have a total after-tax return of $14,656. And the last step is actually doing the after-tax return calculation. 
The total after tax gain or loss we have is a positive $14,656 return. And we'll divide that by the original investment or the basis of $108,000. And that ultimately will give us the answer of 13.57%. In summary, after tax return is basically total return, but with taxes factored out of the returns. And the key part is understanding how different returns are taxed. Qualified dividends are taxed for most investors either at 15 or 20% versus non-qualified dividends are taxable at the investor's tax bracket. Long-term capital gains are taxed for most investors at 15 or 20% while short-term capital gains are again taxed at the investor's tax bracket. Hi, I'm Brandon. If you enjoyed this video, then you'll love the courses I authored with Achievable. Now offering courses on all major FINRA and NASAA exams, I wrote these courses exclusively for Achievable, and they include tons of real-world examples, more videos just like these on dozens of key topics, a built-in study planner, hundreds of chapter review questions, and unlimited practice exams. Our courses are competitively priced and you can try them out for free first to see if our style is the right fit for you. Follow the links below in the description to get started.